He said in verse 10, For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced, since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. Of course, this passage is a continuation of the one that came before it. And especially when you see that word for in verse 10, this is a conjunction. It's a connecting word that causes you to look backward because everything Paul is about to say is in, said in light of what he just said. Now, the last thing he told Titus is, I left you in Crete so that you could set up leadership. You could appoint elders in every congregation. And he gave a list of the the qualifications, the character traits each one needed to have. And the last thing he said in verse 9 was that he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction and in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So you might ask the question logically, all right, why do we need a leadership structure in the church at all? And if we do, why do these men need to be mighty in the scriptures as opposed to, say, business moguls or charismatic personalities? Well, he explains, and he says, for, and the reason that we need leadership that is mighty in the scriptures in God's church is because there are troublemakers. For there are many who are, and he gives this long list, these troublemakers who try to disrupt the church. This has been true in the early church all the way through today, and it will be true until Jesus comes back. There's always going to be tares sown among the wheat. There's going to be wolves that try to ravage the flock. So a leader in God's church needs to be able to give instruction and rebuke. So that's positively and negatively. And I'm not talking positive like, you know, hey, think positive, buddy. I mean, like, this is positively true, and this is negatively not true. We talk about churches can fall into one or the other where you only ever want to say the good thing, but you never confront what's wrong, and then, you know, vice versa. So why do we need guys like that? Because you've got these troublemakers, and he gives three qualities of them here, that they are insubordinate, empty talkers, and deceivers. So very quickly, what, what do these things mean? Insubordinate. These are people that come into the church, unwilling to submit to the leadership there, no respect for those who are in charge, no respect for church order, but are really see themselves as the final authority on all spiritual matters. And I might agree with the pastor most of the time, but ultimately I'm going to have to go with myself here. Secondly, they were empty talkers. You ever know somebody who was an empty talker? You ever been in a meeting and thought to yourself, there's an awful lot of empty talk going on, or watch a, a a political debate, perhaps. I thought, you know, there's a lot of words being said here. I don't know if they mean anything. There's a lot of slick patter. There's a lot of back and forth. There's a lot of really cool, like, applause breaks and moments. But then you kind of sit back and you go, what did any of that mean? Was there any substance to that at all? I sat there for 45 minutes, but what did this guy have to say? Not a lot of truth or substance. And finally, deceivers. These are people who are not just coming in like a bull in the china shop, not just with a lot of empty things to say, but they're willing to lie. They're willing to dissemble. They're willing to feel you out and figure out what you want to hear and tell you that so that you'll listen to them in order to gain a following. And Paul says, there are many like this. And such people exist in every generation. People that resist submitting to any kind of authority. You know, there's opportunities and possibility to disagree with the leadership of the church, but there's a difference between respectfully disagreeing, maybe even parting ways if you need to, and saying, you can't tell me what to do, and I'm not going anywhere. There are those people. Res don't respect authority. Who talk too much without explanation? You know, you try to confront somebody on something, and they've got like 10 minutes of, of talk that all kind of circles around to not answering your question, Right? Or just saying whatever they can to seduce you to their side. And I'm going to give a, maybe a dorky reference here, but have you ever seen The Music Man before? Remember that song, You Got Trouble here in River City? Where he stands up and he convinces everybody through a lot of flash and patter that you've got a problem, and now I'm going to sell you the solution. And you listen to what he says, and it's all ridiculous. And as the audience, you're supposed to listen to the song and laugh because it's all kind of silly, and all the people are panicking, right? Well, you get people like that that come into the church from time to time trying to gain a following, trying to get people on their team for various reasons. And Paul says, this is why you need to have leadership in the church, first of all, to protect against these people, and also that they can be mighty in the scriptures so that they can confront all the empty talk coming out of these people. Jesus, for example, confronted the Pharisees who were like this in a lot of ways. Matthew 23, 15, Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! 
For you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Jesus said that. Can you believe that? Calling people out. Like, you go out of your way to get people on your team. By the time you're done with them, they're, they're twice as bad as you are. A child of hell. And so Titus, going on to Crete, was going to face people like that. And in this generation, Paul says that they are especially of the circumcision party. Note, that word party or, or group is not in the text there. It's given for explanation. Paul says, especially of the circumcision, which is, of course, a reference to Jews. But the reason they add that word in the ESV and some other translations is to communicate. Paul's not talking about Jews per se. There was a faction of people that were Jewish Christians, so-called, that wanted to bring people under subjection to the Old Testament law, especially circumcision. So Paul has been dealing with these people, these Judaizers, in many different forms, for a long time. <laughs> Ever since he first began his ministry, his first missionary journey in Galatia, there were people coming along behind him, and he had to write the letter to the Galatians. He dealt with them in, in the book of Acts chapter 15, with the Pharisees were having a discussion with Paul and Barnabas over the church and who's allowed. He had this discussion everywhere he went. So by now, towards the end of his ministry, Paul knows how to deal with these people. And so what does he tell Titus? They must be silenced. Don't even have the debate with these people. Because the more they talk, the more they're going to confuse God's precious sheep that he bought with his own precious blood. You stand on the truth. Find other men that are willing to stand on the truth and have the backbone to silence some of these people. Now, I know we don't like hearing that to a degree, and I, I myself don't, because we've been raised under First Amendment living, right? Free speech. We want to have more debate and more speech, and we've got to defeat bad speech with good speech. That might work socially, I think it's a pretty good deal to live under that. But when it comes to the church, not everybody gets a vote. Not everybody gets a voice. I've, I've said this before, kind of tongue-in-cheek, and I'll say it again this morning, but there are many feminist theologians that don't like when Paul says that women are not to be teachers in the church but to be silent. And they say, well, that's not fair that we shouldn't be allowed to teach. But I remind everybody of what James said is that not many of you should become teachers, period. Almost nobody should be teachers because you'll receive a stricter judgment because we have the truth that's been handed down to us. And we're not looking for people who are going to innovate and build on it, come up with some new thing, and here's a dangerous new idea. No, my job as your pastor and the leaders and the home fellowship leaders and all that is to pass on the truth as has been taught and received. So wolves don't get a voice in the flock of sheep, right? So this, I'm not saying that the First Amendment is bad or anything like that. I'm saying when it comes to the church, it's a different set of rules. It's a monarchy, and Jesus is king. Amen? And he's going to give a reason why you should do this, why we should uh, try to silence people like this instead of trying to, you know, have it out with them publicly. He gives three quick reasons. First reason, they're upsetting families. You ever known a false doctrine or a bad idea that upsets a family? Maybe you, your child or somebody you know, that a child came home from college, and they had imbibed a lot of strange ideas, and it upset the family. Now, those are maybe not religious ideas, but Paul's talking about that. That these teachings that come in, they cause division and rupture instead of love. Right? Now, Jesus said, you must hate your father and mother if you're going to follow me. But his point was, you've got to be more committed to the truth of God than to holding on to the integrity of your family. But we all know the more you serve Jesus, it makes you a better son, a better daughter, a better husband or father or uh, mother or wife. It's, it's all together when you follow Jesus. But these doctrines come in and they upset families. They split them apart. I've seen guys that imbibe certain doctrines and they begin to follow certain uh, theories and theologies and maybe there's nothing negative to be said right up front about it. But sometimes I'll warn folks, I'll say, I've seen where this path leads. I've seen like marriages split apart over that doctrine. Or I've seen guys go from being kind, loving people to being, you know, jerks that are harsh and, sh and strong with people when they shouldn't be, and it was that doctrine that got them there. The second reason, that it was for shameful gain. They weren't being teachers so that they could serve Jesus and serve the body of Christ, or like Paul said, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. I feel very similarly. Anytime I've ever had a passing thought of, maybe I could do something else, I go, nah, I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do anything else. This is where the Lord has me. But these are people that say, you know, this seems like a good way to make money because people know you're supposed to tithe and give to the church, so why not just tithe and give it to me? 
And there are people that do that. You know, maybe you've met some or you've seen them on TV or you see them online. And it seems like they've always got something to say about money. Everything they do is, hey, give. You've got to give more and you've got to give more. In fact, we're ourselves going through this building project right now. And I hesitate to even bring it up because there's so many people that are out there for shameful gain. And I'll just say again, I don't want your money. I don't need to make money off of you. I'm doing this because I love you, because I love Jesus. And so do your home fellowship leaders, the children's ministry teachers, the elders, and anybody else that we're going to raise up here. And number three, they were teaching what ought not to be. So not only were they ripping people off with the money, not only were they causing trouble in the families, they were wrong. They were just wrong. Their doctrine was incorrect. And Paul says, false doctrine bears bad fruit, so you've got to be able to stop them, which is why you need teachers in the church that know the word and can teach the word so that when somebody comes in with some radical new idea, they say, no, 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 that can't be true because I know what God's word says. When there's no fruit of righteousness in a teacher's life, and you know, I'm having a lot of little rabbit trails today, so I'm going to try to button this up, but we got time. Uh, a lot of times, the people that seem the, the strongest and the most charismatic and the most compelling pastors and teachers that kind of burst on the scene, their lives are very often a mess. You know, they've got a temper problem, or they've got a, a, an adultery problem, or they, they've got greed, but we can twist it where we almost see those things as, as beneficial. Like, see, that man doesn't take anything from anybody. Really? Because Jesus took an awful lot from an awful lot of people for the sake of the church, didn't he? Well, that guy, he's just, he knows who he is. He's just got that, that swagger about him. It's like, really? Because the Bible holds up Moses and said he was the meekest man who ever lived. And not only that, but Jesus denied his, his privileges with the Lord for a time so that he could walk among us and be humble. So, you know, we, we do examine the fruit of a person's life. And if you haven't had time to inspect the fruit, so to speak, just withhold judgment. Don't go all in. Wait and see what happens over time especially when there's corruption involved. But the main test of a, of a false teacher, of a troublemaker in God's church, is truth. Are they teaching what ought not to be taught? Are they teaching false doctrine? This is why we take our time in here, and I love to teach inspirational messages and, and very practical things, but we've also got to take time to dig deep and get into the doctrine, the nitty-gritty of these things. That's one of the reasons we're doing the podcast that we're doing, is I can take the time to go real deep, so that we can grow and marinate in these things, so that even if you don't have the answer to the, to the false teacher, there's just a little alarm bells going off in your head, right? That just doesn't sound right. I don't know if I have an answer for you. That just doesn't sound right. So that we can be prepared for those things. And you should always be on the lookout for people that are trying to, you know, grab you to their side and be on my team and join our this and, and watch out for those, you know, that your, your regular church is doing it wrong. You, what you need is this. This is for the new, new season, new generation. And that's not how God's pastors and God's leaders are to do it. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 2. You know, in, in contrast to the Pharisees we talked about earlier, Paul says, we, as ministers of the gospel, have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. So we're not going to be clever. We're not going to be cute. We're not going to mess with the word. I'm going to kind of hide this bit over here in Isaiah so that nobody knows about it. Or, oh, why did you have to say that, Paul? Let's not talk about that. We refuse to tamper with God's word. But here's what he says. By the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Do you like that? That's kind of our philosophy of, of ministry and teaching here is the open statement of the truth. You know, cult leaders like to, you know, kind of hide what they really think. They don't want to tell you. I remember this, this group of three young adults stopped me outside of a Barnes & Noble. Actually, they stopped Catelyn, and then she called me in, you know, to be the cavalry, I guess. But uh, they had all these weird ideas about, like, the divine goddess that the Bible secretly talks about. And, you know, the, the Trinity isn't real, and the New Testament is all corrupted, and you can't trust it. But you can trust our dude back at, you know, at the wherever temple you want to come to. And they wouldn't tell me what group they belonged to. They wouldn't tell me the name of their leader. They wouldn't give me a book that, you know, could tell me more about. No, 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 you just got to come. You got to see, you've got to renounce everything you've ever known about God and come follow us. That's not how Christians do it. The open statement of the truth. Paul says we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience. So that if somebody, even if they disagree with you, they go, well, you know what? At, at least I know they're not trying to get something out of me. At least they're not trying to lie. At least they're not trying to manipulate me. They're just telling me what it is and, 
And then I can kind of make my decision there. That's how Jesus did it. It's how the apostles do it. And that's how we're trying to do it here as well. The leader's job is to teach the word and then to strongly rebuke those that would resist that. We've got to watch out because the reason we need leaders in the church is we've got a lot of slick people with a lot to say that want to find congregations. Sometimes I've found especially small congregations. Like, oh, I can climb this ladder. They might, not, they might know who I am everywhere else, but they don't know who I am here. They covet the money. The disciples they make go back and disrupt the home. And the way we safeguard that, Paul says, is through strong leaders who are able to teach the word. That's why we have. There's troublemakers out there. So verse 12, to continue now, one of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. And Paul said, this testimony is true. <laughs> Don't you love that? Paul's not like, no, that's a harmful stereotype. No, he's like, no, that's, that's about right, man. This testimony is true. Therefore, verse 13 still, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. So he talked a minute ago about the people he needs to watch out for. Now he's talking about the people he's supposed to take care of. And so Paul's point is the reason you need to set up guys like this is because you've got troublemakers coming in, and the people in your church, Titus, are susceptible to this kind of thing. They're weak. They, they will fall for this. Do you get where he's going, the train of thought here? He quotes from uh, this, he calls him one of the prophets of the Cretans. This was a guy named Epimenides. He was a Greek philosopher. He was a Greek poet. And uh, he's got this line about the Cretans. He was from Crete, and he knew his own people. And it's important for me to say this. Paul is quoting Epimenides as an example, not as an endorsement of everything he said. This is important to note, because sometimes people want to say, well, you see, Paul quoted from Greek philosophy. That means that we should bring in as much Greek philosophy as we can to help interpret the Bible. No, I don't think he meant anything more than that than I did by quoting the music man a few minutes ago. I don't think that's the, seventh, you know, the 67th book of the Bible that we should be studying. I think it helps illustrate a point. That's Paul, what Paul's doing here. And he endorses this rather cynical view of Crete, the people that lived on Crete. And it seems to be that this opinion was shared by most people. The Greeks had a word, and the word was kretizane. You could make it English like Crete eyes, to Cretanize, to act like a Cretan. And the word that meant to act like a Cretan meant to lie or to cheat. So if you're going to say, hey, you're acting just like a Cretan, you're saying, you liar and you cheater. And there's another word, by the way, Corinthiadzestai, which was to Corinthiaize, which meant to act sexually promiscuous. So they, they were very upfront about who they were. And to be a Cretan was to be a liar and a cheat. You see a Cretan in an ancient Greek play, you're supposed to get, all right, this dude is probably, probably up to no good. And that's where Paul had sent Titus to plant churches and had succeeded, by the way. But they needed leaders because he says, these people are, number one, dishonest. Right? They're liars. Number two, they're evil beasts. They're bestial. They just, they do what animals do. They don't act like men. There's no civilization or nobility about them. And then he, he what does he call Let me get it exactly right. Lazy gluttons. The Greek words for lazy glutton is idle stomach. Just a stomach waiting to be fed. That's what he calls them. He uses the word gasterase. It's where we get words like gastrology and gastroenterology and all those are the big words that I'm not pronouncing correctly. Right? Something gastro, it's related to your stomach, right? That's what he calls them, stomachs. All those Cretans, they're just a bunch of lazy stomachs walking around waiting to get fed. And he says, this is true. <laughs> and that's who they were. No honor, no virtue, no integrity. His point that he's going through is false teachers will come, and the people that you're leading are easy targets for these false teachers. They will fall for this. And it's important for us to note here in passing that Paul and Titus had a very frank, open view of the people they were ministering to. They loved them with all their hearts. They were there to help them. However, they knew who they were dealing with. And we need to have our own view of our own culture. We know that American culture has its own vices of excess and indulgence. We can kind of act like stomachs sometimes, can't we? There's another place where Paul says there are people whose God is their belly. The thing that I worship and offer sacrifices to is my stomach. We have our own sins of pride and sloth or any number of things. And I think that we have our, of course, just like the Cretans did, our own virtues as well. But you need to be upfront about who you're ministering to. 
Because any of those things can be exploited by the enemy in order to take people away from the gospel. So there's an important lesson for us to know ourselves culturally, right? We live in, in the Bible Belt. There's a certain hardness when it comes to religion. Like, this is the way we do it, and this is why we do it, and I'm not really interested in it being disrupted by what the Bible actually says. This is just kind of what we do. We know that that's, that's kind of who we are, and we need to watch out for that and to preach and to teach and to evangelize accordingly. But not only that, personally, you sh- if Epimenides were to write something about you to cause Paul to say, this is true, what would he say? I don't think any of you are, you know, evil beasts in here. I sure hope not. But think think it through in your own devotional time. Like, all right, where am I weak? Where should I be afraid that somebody might come in and try to exploit me or lie to me? What what false ideas would be appealing to me? You got to worry about that so that you can be prepared. Now, Paul's solution to pastoring the Cretans, what do you do with pastoring a Cretan church? He says, rebuke them sharply. Do you like that? He says, rebuke them sharply. To speak strongly so that they don't get started down that path. And I got to make sure that we hear this. Because there are some times where people feel like you shouldn't speak strongly in the Christian pulpit. There's some people that like strong preaching a little too much. You know, you ain't yelling, you ain't preaching like at somebody, you know. But then there's others that are like, why do you, why do you got to be so negative like that? Why, why do you got to say things about us? Why do you got to, I love there's a, uh, there's a story of Martin Lloyd-Jones who preached and uh, guest spoke in somebody's church and uh, the, the woman complained to the pastor and said, that man speaks to us as if we were sinners. <laughs> you got to watch out for that. You need to speak strongly. And there are times where I have to come in and I've got to speak strongly on something. And the way that we usually determine when that's going to be is, well, is it a strong passage or not? A few weeks ago, we had a strong Wednesday night because it was Abimelech. It's a horrible story of what happened in Israel. So, yeah, I spoke a little strongly. This morning, not so much because he's just reminding Titus, hey, you got to be there and be strong for your people. Rebuke them sharply. Speak strongly. We see an example of this in 3 John I love the book of 3 John. You can read it in like 10 minutes. It's just a couple verses, but that's not why I like it. It's just, you know. <laughs> but let me read this situation that was going on that John writes about. He says, I have written something to the church. Wow, John, the apostle, wrote a letter to your church. But Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first. Don't you like that? How does the apostle John evaluate you? He likes to be first. It's like when you know, you're waiting in line for something and there's somebody that didn't learn that like no cutsies in the kindergarten and they just kind of like, oh, I, I'm not going to wait in that line. It's like, yeah, you're about to because I'm behind you here, you know. Likes to be first and he does not acknowledge our authority, just like Paul was talking about, right? So verse 10, John says, so if I come, I will bring up what he is doing. I'm sure there will be more to it than just, you know, bringing it up. This is one of the sons of thunder, don't forget talking wicked nonsense against us. And not consent, content with that, Diotrephes refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. So this guy, Diotrephes, had gotten in control of the church that John was writing to, wasn't receiving letters from the apostles, wasn't receiving missionaries or other teachers, and if anybody wanted to have them, he kicked them out of the church because he wanted to be first. So what does John say? I'm not going to even write to him. I'm just going to show up and I'll handle it myself. That's how John dealt with it. And this is what Paul is telling Titus to do. We actually see from the book of 2 Corinthians that Titus was the one that carried the letters from Paul to Corinth, the Corinthian church. They had all sorts of crazy stuff going on there. People were getting drunk during communion. They had like separate places for poor Christians and rich Christians. They had a dude that was having an incestuous relationship with his mother-in-law, and they were like letting him testify about God's grace in his life. And Paul's like, I don't think so, man. And so who do you send to deal with that? Titus. Who do you send to pastor the churches in Crete, full of liars, evil beasts, and empty stomachs? Titus. Tells us a little something about him without coming out and saying it, doesn't it? He's telling Timothy all the time, be strong, Timothy. Don't be afraid, Timothy. Don't be timid. God has not given us a spirit of fear. Titus, he says, you know what to do. Just go deal with it, Titus. It's just important to remember that. A pastor's work, a leader's work, home fellowship, children's ministry, whatever you end up doing, is not merely positive, you know, teaching. That's good. You need that. But you also need to have the negative warning because there are popular lies that will seep into the church that will draw people away. And it's not that you, you know, I'm so excited to fight against these people. And that's kind of how I felt when I came out of seminary. It's like, I'll debate anybody. I'll just, you come right up here and I'll tell you what's what. And 
Now I've, I've learned a little better since I've had children and pastored my own church and, you know, grown a little bit. Is it like, it's not about that. It's about y'all. It's about loving you enough to take care of you, about loving those kids that are in there and being bombarded by all sorts of other teachings and other ideas that when they come in, we have to speak with authority and speak strongly. No, that's not right. This is right. You know, you, you've got to be able to do that. And just because, oh, I don't like it when it gets a little, little tense, a little rough in here, well, that's part of the job. I mean, read through your Old Testament. This always, I mean, for every Psalm 23, there's Nahum chapter 1. The Lord has, has both of these things, the fear of the Lord and the love of the Lord. It all has to come together. And he tells Titus, rebuke these Cretans strongly. If you see them going down that way, don't mess around. Stop it. Put a stop to it. Because you know what they're like, and they'll follow right along if you, if you let them. And he gives two things in particular for them to watch out for. Number one was Jewish myths. Now, of course, Paul was Jewish. He's not saying that being Jewish is somehow evil or sinful. I don't think any of you thought that, but there have been people that have taught that throughout history. He's talking about Jewish myths and legends. In the other pastoral epistles, he mentions this too, that there are people that were obsessed with like the genealogies. Like, you know, the, you know, so-and-so begot so-and-so and begot so-and-so. And you read that, and who wants to do that? Well, you haven't understood the mystical, spiritual nature behind this. And if you read the code and you calculate the numbers and you read it upside down and play the record backwards, that's the true gospel, man. And Paul's like, what are you talking about? Jewish myths, legends. Perhaps this is the precursor of things like the Kabbalah, which is like Gnostic Judaism, where it's, it's not even the Old Testament. It's the Old Testament, but filtered through this like magical lens or this weird Greek uh, polytheistic lens of looking at things. And Paul's like, Don't, tell them to stay away from that stuff. Maybe it was these guys like the sons of Sceva. Remember them? He said, Sceva was a Jewish high priest. I don't think Sceva was a high priest. I think he was marketing himself as a high priest. So I can come and cast demons out of your house. And he was a total fraud and charlatan. But if you're living in Rome, here's some guy from the East, this Eastern religion. He knows how to cast out demons. They've got this ancient truth. And Paul's like, just stay away from people like that. He says in 1 Timothy, he says, these are people that desire to be teachers of the law, but have no idea what they're talking about. And there's a lot of those people on YouTube who think that they know something about the Old Testament law, but you really, they're not preaching the law. They're preaching their weird ideas through the medium of the law. So Jewish myths, but also the commands of unbelievers. So and the first one was mysticism. The second one we can say is asceticism. People that were giving them extra commandments, extra works to do that had nothing to do with scripture, but had everything to do with their opinions and their ideas. Remember when Jesus rebuked them? I believe it was in Mark chapter 7 when he says, for you teach as doctrines the commandments of men. And Jesus, in that sense, was really pushing hard against that Jewish traditional understanding. He says, you're teaching your ideas, your traditions, as if they're doctrine. And he actually takes that from Isaiah, who said, the first, said that first. People that teach their own opinions as God's opinions. And we still have people like that to this day. And there's always those that want to make you feel more spiritual for this way of praying and don't do these things. They have nothing to do with the gospel, but if you don't do them, you're, you're showing yourself to be more spiritual and more obedient. And, and Paul knew these things were spreading. And his recommendation was to insist on the truth strongly, to step in and say, no, we're not doing that here. Not only for Titus to do that, but to find other people who would also do that. There's always other weird ideas that blow through that want to encroach in our day and age and you know, there's mysticism. There's all kinds of mysticism out there. For some reason, I've been in a lot of airports lately. There's always some weird, like, meditation, witchcraft, secret code of the this and that, blah, 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 for sale in the airport. And I see people, like, flipping these things and looking through them. And I'm like, don't you see how preposterous this is? And this idea that you're going to, like, you know, strain your way to health and, you know, going to find your spirit guide and follow that through all of your dreams and all that. And but people are empty spiritually. And if they feel like they're not connecting with God because they're not, they're dead in their sins, they can be susceptible to those kinds of temptations. Or other people fall for these, these extra commands, these extra do's and don'ts that make you feel ascetic and make you feel spiritual, that subtly start to replace those of Jesus. 
Because if you want to look at all the things Jesus asked us to do, yes, we are to walk in righteousness, but anything that is not related to sin is, is, is wide open. And that's alarming for a lot of people because they go, okay, well, we can't just be free to do whatever because then we'll, we'll, we'll drift into sin again. So what do we do? We rebuild the barriers that Jesus tore down. And then a whole new generation needs to come and be delivered from those things. Look at what Paul says in Ephesians 4. He's coming at the end of a long uh, diatribe here about the various sins and doctrines they were facing. But look what he says in Ephesians 4.20. He says, but that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. And that phrase, but you have not so learned Christ, I think that's a great phrase we can apply to our lives. Look at the things you're doing religiously and spiritually. Did you learn that from Jesus? Did you learn that practice or that idea or that philosophy of life? Did you get it from Jesus? And sometimes we can even roll our eyes, oh, come on, it's not all about that. Yeah, it is. Jesus is the truth. And many times we're impressed by the, by the philosophy and the wisdom, the mental gymnastics of other teachers, and we feel like the Bible is somehow not up to that challenge, but not realizing that all those philosophies, the Bible says God put those things to shame to offer us this simple gospel. So if you've got an idea in your head about what you should and shouldn't do, or what you should and shouldn't believe, just ask yourself that question. Did I learn this from Jesus? Or did I learn this through a podcast that I listened to? Did I learn it from that friend that's really into this weird, you know, Eastern mystical thing? Did I find it on Instagram or did I find it in Scripture? I'm not even saying all those things are evil, but you've got to know where it's come from. And you also, by the way, should just be bathing yourself in the Word every single day so that the primary influence on your thought and behavior is not coming from TV or the Internet, but from Jesus, from the Scriptures. This is why we put all of our things online. This is why we do the, the devotional videos and write the books, to be constantly giving you things of, of various angles to shape your thinking according to Christ, to what Jesus said. And again, this is about knowing yourself. Where are you weak and susceptible? I'll tell you right now, I'm weak and susceptible to things that are like, you can do it, you don't need anybody else, and you know, shut out the haters and just go for it, man. Because that appeals to my flesh, because I'm competitive. And I want to win. I want to be on top. But guess what? The only way to win with Jesus is to lose. The way that Jacob defeated the angel at the brook was to surrender, <laughs> to weep and ask his favor and say, Lord, please, I can't let you go until you bless me. That appeals to my flesh, but it's got to die so that I can walk with Christ. So what is it for you? What sins appeal to you? I mean, we talked about being empty stomachs. Does gluttony appeal to you? Is that difficult for you? Because that's kind of a minor sin. Yeah, but don't you know that once you've indulged your flesh above what you should, you feel dull spiritually? Is that anybody else? When you've, you've given in to some kind of excess, whatever it might be, we'll, we'll, you know, we're talking about gluttony, like even food here. You, know, you finish your Thanksgiving dinner, and that's one thing. It's feasting, you understand. We have those times of year. But do you feel sharper mentally? <laughs> right? When you indulge your flesh, you're teaching yourself to indulge your flesh. So you've got to watch out. Where are you weak? I don't know where you're weak, but you do, and the Holy Spirit does. Know yourself and be prepared. Titus was not only walking into a place with false teachers, but with weak people. And so he needed to have the strength of Jesus to protect the flock and to guard them by the truth of Scripture. Finishing it up now, verses 15 and 16. To the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for any good work. If you ever want to see some more of that, read the book of Jude. Half of Jude is basically a bunch of insults of false teachers. It's, it's poetic and wonderful, but I'm not making that up. You kind of, everybody kind of pulled back on me. I'm serious. He says, I need to write you about these false teachers. Let me tell you what they are. And then he just goes, boom, 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 boom. The idea is stay away from people like that. So he gives this kind of proverbial statement here. To the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Why is he talking about purity all of a sudden? Well, he's actually kind of addressing the issue that was facing the churches in Crete at this point. Because they were dealing with Jewish myths and these extra commandments. And this word for pure can also be clean. It's talking about that Old Testament Levitical word to be clean, to be pure and accepted before God. So 
These people are telling you, if you want to be clean before God, if you want to be acceptable, if you want to be in Jesus, if you want to be with God, you've got to do these things. You've got to have this weird experience. You've got to obey these special commandments. And Paul comes in and goes, to the defiled and unbelieving pe- person, you can do whatever you want. You're still not going to be clean and pure and acceptable before God. It means acceptable or permissible. But he says, to the pure, all things are pure. I used to have my youth leader quote this verse to me a lot about uh, dirty jokes. That you shouldn't even think that because the pure, all things are pure. That's a good application, but it's not quite what he's getting at. What he's getting at is if you have been made pure by the blood of Jesus Christ, then the things of this life are already pure and there for your use and enjoyment. Meanwhile, these people that are unbelievers and think they're doing everything they can to make themselves pure, Paul goes, you can do whatever you want and you won't be pure because you're separated from Christ. This was the most common accusation that Paul faced. Romans 6.1, remember? What then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, may it never be. May again, I tell. What are you, nuts, right? They accused Paul of this, that you're teaching people that they can do whatever they want. Now, was Paul teaching people that? No. However, Paul was teaching grace to such a degree that a lot of people thought that. What does that tell you about what Paul was teaching? About the freedom that we have in Christ. It was enough that good religious people were thinking, Paul, you're taking it a little far, don't you think? But Paul wasn't worried about people doing all sorts of crazy things. He wanted them to realize what Jesus had done for them at the cross was enough to save them. There was nothing else to be done. People could not accept the idea that forgiveness in Christ meant freedom in Christ. That if you're in Jesus, if you are pure, then all things are pure. Like Adam and Eve, the world is opened up to you for you to go and be fruitful and multiply and live a great life. And I'm going to demonstrate this with two scriptures here. We've talked about it at length before, but just to remind you the kinds of things Paul was going around teaching. First of all, let's quote from the Lord himself. Let's quote Jesus. Mark 7, 18 through 20. Talking about the food laws here, right? He says, do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him? Not does not, cannot. Well, how can you say that, Jesus? Moses told us about these food laws. Moses told, and how can you say this? I mean, people think that you kind of are drinking more than you should, Jesus. How is this going? He says, listen, because it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and then is expelled. Yeah, Jesus said that. Mark gives us a little parentheses. Thus he declared all foods clean. And Jesus said what comes out of a person is what defiles him. What is Jesus saying? He's like, it's enough with these silly little rules that you think are making you righteous. What you eat has nothing to do with your heart. What you drink has nothing to do with your heart. What you you take in your body is going to go in your body and go out. What you should be more worried about is your heart and your soul. So Jesus was declaring all foods to be clean. So that's pretty straightforward for those of you that are concerned about whether or not you should keep the dietary laws. As Paul would say in Romans 14, keep them if you want to, but just know you're not getting any kind of leg up on salvation. In Romans 14, 14, Paul said, I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. Just hear that. (laughs) Nothing is unclean in itself. But it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. If it provokes sin in your conscience, then yes, it's a problem. But what we're talking about, there's there's righteousness and unrighteousness, but then there's this whole other category of neutral things that we're always trying to figure out which category they belong to. Paul comes in and says, if you you ain't sinning, it's fine. And we go, I don't know about that. I can see it in your eyes. I feel the same way sometimes. This is why people accuse Paul of pushing it too far. But what is he saying? To the pure, all things are pure. Don't fall for somebody coming in telling you, here's the extra 10 things you've got to do to be saved. You're already purified. Oh, you know, if you dress that way, then God won't accept you. To the pure, all things are pure. Oh, you know, if you eat that food or you worship on that day, you better watch out. Paul says, to the pure, all things are pure. Well, you're not as clean as I am. He goes, no, 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 you're an unbeliever. You're, you're, you're not, nothing you do is clean because it's not about what you do. It's not about how you keep your hair. It's not about what you eat. It's not about any of that stuff. That stuff is just neutral. And if you're in Christ, then it can be redeemed for his glory. But if you're not in Christ, there's nothing you can do to save yourself. They were preaching works salvation. All these matters. Circumcision was the big one. Holy days. Dietary restrictions. Various ascetic practices. They were all offered as replacements for the free grace that is in Christ Jesus. 
You've been saved by grace. Praise the Lord. But in order to secure the grace, you know, here's five more things. It's like trying to get an extended warranty somewhere. It's like, this is good. You know, you've got the 30-day warranty. But if you don't buy this one, then you won't be extra safe. And, and if you're like me, you go, well, if it's going to break, I'm not going to buy it. No, no, it's perfectly good. Then I don't need the warranty. Thank you very much. That's kind of what people try to do with Christ. They come in and say, yeah, Jesus saved you, but if you want to be extra, super duper, triple stamp saved, you know, you can't watch those movies anymore. Or you can't keep your hair like that anymore. Or you can't eat that anymore. And are, are you sure that you should be worshiping on Sunday? I don't know about that. What does any of that have to do with Jesus and his blood being poured out on the cross, washing away every sin? These teachers' hearts were defiled. Not clean as they pretend. I can make you clean. Nobody can make you clean but Jesus. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And making sure you listen to the right music. And making sure you vote right. And making... No, none of that touches your soul, does it? Well, I think it might. Well, pray about that. What if somebody doesn't? Are they going to be kept out of heaven? Well, no. Then stop. (laughs) Then stop. We talked about this at length in Romans 14, but this is what Paul's trying to teach people. Titus, your job is to go in there and prevent people from coming into bondage again. Look at the fruit of these people's lives. It was rotten. Did they say, oh, I know God. I've been saved. I know Jesus. I go to church. And Paul goes, yeah, but I look at your life. And that's not how a Christian lives. So much for the idea that Paul didn't believe that works were important, was it? Many people try to pit James and Paul against each other. It's simply not the case. He said, by the way you live, it's a denial of the knowledge of God. They were detestable which is that word is abominable. It's probably Paul making a play on words from the Old Testament that such and such is an abomination before the Lord. Paul goes, you're an abomination before the Lord. Number two, disobedient. How are they disobedient? To the gospel. Because you're not saved by works, you're saved by faith. Jesus said, this is the work that the Lord requires of you, to believe on Jesus Christ whom he has sent. And number three, they're useless. They're useless, unfit for any good work. And that's a major theme of the book of Titus, by the way, is the gospel producing good works in our lives. These are people that, they don't do anyone any good. They just revel in their doctrines. You ever met somebody like that? What do we do at at our group? We are right, and we sit around and be right, and then we go home and we're right. (laughs) How does that help anybody? We help anybody by being right. And by pointing out that they're all wrong, okay, but, I mean, has that caused you to be more loving? Has it caused you to be more kind? Are you a more patient person since you've adopted this doctrine? No, but I'm right. I know God. Like, Do you? Because the Lord tells us what it looks like when somebody knows God. Many, many people that claim to be, you know, theological preachers. And remember, we do need to speak strongly, but remember, they, they say, I'm a, I'm a theological person. And what they mean by that is, I'm a, I'm a very angry person. I'm very impatient. I have no patience for this kind of thing. Well, you're supposed to have patience with people. You're supposed to be kind. You're supposed to be gentle. A pastor and a teacher and a Christian is supposed to be gentle. Be self-controlled, faithful, kind. I said it twice here. Don't just revel in your doctrine and not do anybody good. That's, that's useless religion. It's going back to idolatry. That We've got this new, weird, mystical Jewish thing. We've got this new set of ascetic uh, commandments to obey. It's all legalism. If you have something that says you cannot do this and be saved, or if you don't do this, you won't be saved, you're adding to the cross. Yikes. You don't want to do that, do you? And many people don't want to add to the cross. And so what Titus' job to do is to show them, hey, you're, you're straying into this over here. Now, you might be even addressing something that needs a rebuke or needs a warning or needs to be dealt with, but don't bring it into that category. There is a very narrow room for only one thing category of salvation, and that's the blood of Jesus, the cross and the empty tomb. And you add to that, you're in trouble. And this is the kind of trouble that Titus was supposed to confront through his sound teaching and through sharp rebuke, too. You know, people place a lot of expectations on their pastors to do all, all number of things. And I know a pastor friend back in Virginia who's, Oh, I forget what it was. His daughter, I believe, was sick, and he was home with his daughter, and you know he was uh, going to miss their, their Christmas cantata. And he's like, I'm not going to be able to make it. And, and then he had a, a group of people come to say, we expect our pastor to be at the Christmas cantata. Well, I'm not going to be preaching or sharing it, no, but you need to be there. And they like threatened to remove him as pastor for that. And it's like, all right, maybe he, he could have gone and, and helped out, but it's just kind of, we would talk about this, and he'd be like, where in the Bible does it say I have to go to the Christmas cantata? 
He's not trying to be a jerk, but he's saying, look, my job is to preach the word and, and raise up saints to, to do the ministry. But we get all these expectations, and they're not all bad. That's a pretty minor example, right? If, unless you want to take it that far. But what is, it? what is the leadership in the church's main job? It's to teach the word and to guard the congregation against false doctrine. That's why in Acts chapter 6, the apostles said, we're not going to leave this job. If there's something important that needs to be done, find a good man who can do it. But we're not going to leave this right here. So we kind of come to the end of this passage here, but I want to take some time. I kind of said these things in passing, but I just want to kind of do some of what we talked about today. Have you yourself understood the grace that is in Christ? Would you say that your relationship with Jesus, your, the way you relate to God, is it a grace relationship, meaning it's a, it's a free gift of acceptance and love, or do you feel like you're constantly having to work your way back up? Have you been inoculated against these lies? Turn to the left just a little bit here. Uh, you're going to hit all the T's, and you're going to hit Colossians. When you get to Colossians chapter 2, I'm going to read a kind of a longish section here, because um, I know that these things that Titus was to warn about still happen and still go on. And I want to make sure that we ourselves are, are free in Christ. Let's read this. Colossians 2, 16 to the end of the chapter, verse 23. Hear this very carefully now. Let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism, which is like the beating down of the body, right? Or worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ... You died to the elemental spirits or the fundamental truths of the world. Why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Referring to things that all perish as they are used. According to human precepts and teachings. These indeed, hear this now y'all, these indeed have an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Aren't you glad that section's in the Bible? Paul says, don't let somebody come in and put a guilt trip on you about stuff that has nothing to do with Jesus. Because all of you know, we've all probably dealt up with this to one form or another, you start going down that legalistic path, you will learn very quickly, you're not able to keep that either. And you are constantly under this weight of guilt and shame and just kind of shuffling along before the Lord. Or you become so puffed up and full of pride, you spend your time making everybody else feel that way. When Paul goes, I don't want that for you. What about Sabbath days and food and don't touch that and don't eat that and don't hold that. Paul goes, what does that have anything to do with Christ? It seems very religious and it seems very spiritual. And it makes the people around the world go, wow, look at those guys. But Paul goes, but it has no value in doing anything for your heart. Tricky people try to point us to their rules and their weird beliefs. But guys, the answer is no, sir. I don't want that. Your salvation, if you want to be forgiven, if you want to go to heaven, if you want to be delivered from the guilt of your soul, that can only come through the shed blood of Jesus on the cross. That Jesus took on the cross what you deserved. He who was sinless, the very Son of God, hung on that cross, bleeding and battered for you. All the things in your guilt-ridden moments where you can't even hardly open your eyes, you don't want to look yourself in the mirror, everything you think you deserve in that moment, Jesus took it. Jesus endured that on that day. He died as a substitute instead of you so that he could freely give you his righteousness. The word is imputed. It's an accounting term means it's, it's legizomai is the Greek word. It says, you've got a bunch of sin in your column and not much in your righteousness column. What does God do? He blots out all the sins, takes the righteousness of Jesus, and puts that in your plus column. Imputed righteousness. You are already pure. Do you get where Paul's getting at now? I'm telling you this. If you believe in Jesus, if you've been born again, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you are saved. It's not your life, oh, I hope I make it in the end. 
Is that why Jesus died? Jesus, I'm going to die on the cross and forgive all their sins and rise from the dead so they can spend the rest of their life hoping I make it in. <laughs> Jesus died so that he could do away with all that, so that you could know all things are pure. You are free indeed. And what Paul is reminding Titus, don't let people come in and ruin life for all of God's people. Because life is good. There's so many things to enjoy and delight in in life. There's sinful things, but leave that aside for a minute. There's so much that's good in life. Don't let people come along and wreck that for everybody. Well, I don't see how you can be a Christian and do that. Well, it's not really up to whether you see that or not. What did Jesus say? My job as a pastor is to safeguard the truth, not so that I can be right and we can be right, so that I can offer you hope and joy in Jesus. A leader in the church, Paul says, is to be so jealous of the joy of a Christian that he's willing to step up and put the gloves on for somebody that would try to steal it. Because I know what it's like to be racked by guilt. I know what it's like to think I've committed the unforgivable sin. And to spend your days just, I can't even lift my eyes to heaven. Oh God, I'm so sorry. Please don't blow me up. Please don't send me to hell, Jesus. I know how that feels. And when you can finally accept the grace of God, that it's a free gift, it's offered by faith, there's nothing you've got to do to receive it, there's nothing you can do to add to it, the relief oh, just washes over you. When you can, you're telling me that I'm already accepted? Yes. Yes, you are. Oh, that relief and that peace that comes into your heart. And you're no longer worried about, oh, is this accidentally sinful? Did I accidentally mess up? I'm sorry, God. And you stop living like that? There's nothing better than that. And that's what Jesus has for each of us, which is why we, we don't put up with those false doctrines. There's no value in you keeping a bunch of religious rules that have nothing to do with righteousness. Well, you know, we worship on Saturday, not Sunday. Congratulations. <laughs> we worship on Wednesday nights and Tuesdays and Thursdays and Fridays. And, you know, Saturday, why not add that? No, no, if you worship on Sunday, you can't be saved. Really? Jesus' blood covers everything except for worshiping on the wrong day? Jesus' blood covers everything except what you eat or what you wear. Remember, we're leaving sin out of this. I'm talking about things that are neutral. The whole world of neutral is available to you. You know, the Bible even says that you redeem and purify things as you touch them, not the other way around. That's what Paul says. The Holy Spirit is so powerful in you that the things that you engage in become righteous as you do them, if they're neutral, not the other way around. I'm telling you guys, this is what the Bible teaches. Not these legalistic matters, these cultural rules. Nor do you need to be, by the way, infatuated with strange mystical experiences. There's been this weird promotion lately of this, this interest, renewed interest in psychedelics. Have you noticed that? Oh man, there's drugs. You know, you ever tried DMT? You ever tried LSD? You know, my mind is just open. Why? Like, didn't we try that? Didn't we already like see that, reject it, and move on? Or there's people that want to tell you about, you know, that this is a great relaxation meditation technique. What do we need that stuff for? Oh, I see angels everywhere I go. I wish I saw angels everywhere I go, but it's not going to add a lick to my salvation. Right? It's not. It's just going to be a cool thing. Now, you don't need to fear people that claim to have special visions from God. Don't you know that the great prophet heard from the Lord? I don't need the great prophet. I've got Jesus, the Son of God. God, who at various times and in various ways has spoken to us by the fathers, has now in these last days spoken us through his son, Jesus Christ. He's spoken to you through his son. That's enough. We're all susceptible in our own ways. Some of you, you really are not susceptible to these sins of the flesh. You know, I don't get why people can't just control what they eat. Well, good for you. Congratulations. The rest of us are you know, carrying this, this cross up the mountain. But then there's others of you that don't understand. I don't see how anybody can even be tempted by that weird mystical stuff. But there's all sorts in here, guys. We all have various things that we struggle with and deal with. And you've got to be on the lookout for that. Let the truth of the gospel be your special protection. How am I saved? By grace through faith. Boom. Nothing else needs to come in there. God loved you enough to redeem you from idolatry, to redeem you from dead religion. So today, just take it. It's free. There's no ceremony. There's no ritual. There's no waiting period. You don't got to check your credit. You just come. Come just as you are and let the Lord redeem you. And once you've come, don't sit there and think, okay, well, now what do I do? Now you just revel in the grace of Jesus and you go live as a redeemed soul. Everything else is opened up to you. And someday, everything you've done in Christ will be rewarded as you spend eternity with Christ forever. 
And that is what Titus was to guard and protect. That truth and that joy and that peace in the church. And there will be troublemakers that are going to come through our doors. We've not really had that happen before, but it does happen. When the day comes, we'll deal with it. But I'll tell you what I believe. Through the faithful teaching of the word, not only will we be protected against that kind of thing, I believe that even potential troublemakers can be brought to the grace and the truth of Jesus Christ by the power of our holy God. Amen.